there's a step just coming up. Yep, just there. Oh, sorry. Got just, it. Yeah, it'll just guide you over here. Thanks for being seat. here on a very, very hot a seat uh, spring you, evening. I'm sure you've got better things to do, so I'm particularly grateful because talking to yourself is a bit meaningless unless you're in the government, of course. <laughs> Come on, smile. <laughs> <laughs> okay, got some more stuff. Uh, there we go. Bobby, good boy. Nice. Just going to pour you a glass of water. Thank you. It's just... I'm just going to slip my jacket off. It's quite warm. Good. I can see you're going to be a very silent audience. Um, <laughs> nah. I'll have to try and say Let something that is meaningful to make your sojourn tonight worthwhile. OK. Good. Let's, let's go for it. So, first of all, thank you so much to everybody for coming. Um, it's really great to see you turn out of this, especially in the middle of exam season, as David has said. Um, I'll just briefly give a quick overview of the format. So we're just going to start by Dave and I are going to have a chat for about 20 minutes, and then we'll open up to you questions from the floor. So um, David, or Lord Blunkett, is a British politician, now in the House of Lords, who was MP for the Sheffield, Brightside and Hillsborough constituency for 28 years until the 2015 general election when he stood down. He then rose to become Education and Employment Secretary, Home Secretary and Work and Pension Secretary in Tony Blair's cabinet following Labour's victory in the 1997 general election. So, David, you grew up in quite a deprived area of Sheffield, and after school, you attended the Royal National College for the Blind. Did you find that, sort of, throughout your education, people tried to almost limit your aspiration and talk down your prospects because of being blind? Yeah, well, two things happened in those very early days. Firstly, you had to go to a residential school for the blind. You couldn't go to the school around the corner. And that was no choice for my mum and dad, and that was at the age of four. So it was a, a wrench. Those of you who went to residential prep school will know what it's like when, you, when you're very young and you're disconnected from family and friends. And so that was a, a trauma. And then my dad was killed in a works accident when I was 12, which just added to the, uh, the, the, the difficulty and pressure. The school I went to uh, was uh, an, an ordinary primary school, except you had an extra year. And at the end of that extra year, they did what is now called the 11 plus and uh, some of you will have gone through the 11 plus if you live in Buckinghamshire or uh, uh, Kent or Trafford in Greater Manchester and one or two other places and the exam was to test whether you were academically able enough to take a uh, an intellectually stimulating and academic course and they didn't even put me in for it because they thought I was too disruptive to go to the residential grammar school for boys, which was based in Worcester. There was only one grammar school for boys in England and Wales, and it was at Worcester. Um, and so I went to what was called a technical school in Shropshire, the, what is now the Royal National College for the Blind and has become a, a post-16 uh, college for, for blind and partially sighted uh, men and women. And the... You asked me a straight question about what was the expectation. Well, the guy who ran the college had a PhD, but didn't think that blind children at his school could actually take external examinations. So at 16, well, I didn't have any. In those days, it was O-levels, now GCSEs, obviously. And so I decided, with about three or four other students at the college, that we would go down to the local technical school in the evening and we'd start getting the academic qualifications that we knew we needed to succeed. I mean, how I did it, I really don't know. Thinking back, it, it was daunting at the time, but just thinking on it, why, why was I committed to doing that when other kids were playing cards or messing about with a ball with ball bearings in it and doing it two nights a week and getting the qualifications, the O-levels, in one year? I mean. It seems insane now, and had I failed in that first year, I probably wouldn't have had the confidence to keep going, because the college that I was at, they weren't interested. Eventually, we persuaded them that they would get somebody in to teach us English. And again, that was an inspiring moment when the teacher asked me if I understood who'd written a particular poem she read out, and when I actually knew that it was John Keats, she was so interested that she gave me extra tuition. So I did manage to get the O-levels over a period of time uh, to be able to proceed. 
but the college was offering piano tuning, which is fine, and for people who had a musical bent, that was good because they, they took musical qualifications, you know, RCM qualifications as well. Um, they taught short, what was known then as shorthand and typing, which I took because I decided that if I could, if I could word, what is now word process, if I could type and I could take shorthand, there was just a chance that I might be able to use those skills in the future, which of course I could. Um, but the, the, the way that they approached it was lowest common denominator, and I mean, that is deeply, deeply depressing. So the, the four or five of us who made it, who came through and did other things, uh, must have had enormous tenacity, pig-headedness, awkwardness, and when you can't see and you're awkward and pig-headed, people think, you know, there's something amiss that you're being, um, you've got a chip on your shoulder. Well, I think I probably had. I probably had s several bags of chips on my shoulder. Uh, but the fact that trying succeeded was a great level. And just to cut the story very short, I went back to Sheffield. Uh, the Royal National Institute for the Blind had this brilliant idea that had, as my dad had been killed in a works accident for, in the gas industry, uh, their careers people would get me a job in the gas industry. It's all a bit macabre, really. However, they did agree to give me day release from work. So I went a day a week from work to do a national certificate in business studies. And in the evening, I went and did A-levels. And when I'd actually got the national certificate and three A-levels, I got uh, a place at the University of Sheffield. So that's in a nutshell. That took me till I was 22. So I was semi-mature. I was yeah. kind of mature, but not very mature. I hadn't had a, much of a social life. I caught up on that in my 40s and 50s. <laughs> That's great. Um, so while you were attending the University of Sheffield, you studied politics, and while there, you were elected as the youngest ever member of Sheffield City Council, age 22. What prompted you to sort of put yourself out there and run for local government? Kind of the madness that says, I can change the world, that I can make a difference, that... My dad's death was unnecessary. My grandfather, who went into what was a geriatric wing of a, uh, the most decrepit building ever and fell down steps in his early 90s. And I swore then that if I ever had the chance, I would, I would replace those awful workhouse geriatric units with decent homes and decent support for people at home. And I'm very fortunate because I had the chance to do that, I, I chaired the Social Services Committee on Sheffield before becoming the leader of the council in 1980. We literally transformed social services. We set up the first ever homes for what is now described as dementia. Uh, we, we set up a free home help and warden service throughout the city. Uh, and I was able to do something to put right what my grandfather had experienced later on I was responsible for the health and safety executive nationally and I used to say to people don't mock the importance of health and safety because you know my dad died because there wasn't proper health and safety so we needed to do something drastic about it so I've been very fortunate that the pig-headedness that got me into it has actually stood me in good stead actually back in I was listening to a program about reflecting on the past and in 1972 when Ted Heath was the Prime Minister and had got in on in 1970, defeated Harold Wilson on the promise of slashing prices at a stroke, introduced a price policy that put a cap on uh, increases in prices of non-perishable foods for six months and a wages policy that matched inflation with wages. It was a crazy policy because it pushed inflation up. But it's very interesting that 50 years ago, the same issues were prevalent then with very different solutions. And a year later, the Yom Kippur War uh, emerged with Israel uh, 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 against uh, Egypt and Syria. And that created an oil crisis which pushed oil prices up. Mm. And at the same time, the Soviet Union, which included Ukraine, was having a crisis in terms of the grain harvests for two years, which led to a massive increase in world grain prices we, you know, 50 years on, where are we now? Well, 
while you were at leader of Sheffield City Council, you also were elected to the Labour Party's National Executive Committee. I think there was, there was quite some division in the Labour Party during your time on the NEC, with Neil Kennock, who was leader at the time, throwing out a number of MPs from the party. Do you think there's parallels there with the direction Labour's been moving in the last well, couple of years? Well, reg regrettably, yes. I mean, we, we don't learn from history. We often just repeat it. We go round and round. I, I always think, those of you who are studying politics or related um, disciplines, you get action and reaction. I think you get that in science, but I'm not a great scientist. So I managed to get O-level physics only by writing the answers in such an ambiguous way that as the examiner obviously knew the right answers, I hoped that they would give me the benefit of the doubt, which, which they did. But I mean, you know, my, my description of an internal combustion engine was something else, which is old hat now. Um, so I, I think you get action and reaction. And in each generation, people have to go through the same traumas. In the Labour Party, it was called the militant tendency in the 1980s. They were a Trotskyite group that entered the Labour Party with the intention of taking it over. Uh, and in parts of the country, in particular Liverpool, but not just exclusively, they were quite successful and took over the local government scene um, in that city. And Neil Kinnock was trying to deal with it uh, at a time when I was, not, I was unsympathetic to militant tendency but I was sympathetic to their campaigns against massive public expenditure cuts. Here, here we've been all over the last decade, we've been through it all again. And it's funny how at moments like that, you get this reaction that throws up, um, in, in our case, the far left, in the case of Brexit, the far right, um, actually seeking to take over the mainstream parties. UKIP were very successful in taking over the Conservative Party, uh, which is fractured, but is still one party. The Labour Party was uh, unsuccessful in seeing off uh, parts of momentum. There were parts of the momentum group that uh, were backing Jeremy Corbyn, who I could perfectly have a conversation with and a proper debate. I was like them, very strongly against austerity and the amount of borrowing that we did during the two years of the COVID, the main uh, episode of the COVID pandemic, demonstrated actually how unnecessary the austerity measures were, the massive cuts that took place from 2010 onwards. We could have borrowed and we could have uh, smoothed the repayments of that over a long period of time, which is of course what we'll need to do now. So I was very sympathetic to that side of what they were doing. I was deeply unsympathetic uh, to the loony way in which they presented it, to the thuggery and anti-Semitism and sheer anti-socialist behaviour that they displayed. And I'm glad we managed to push them out of uh, power. But it was just like the militant tendency. I was with Neil Kinnock. He, he relied on about four of us. We used to win votes by two or three on the National Executive Committee. And we eventually got a situation where we were able to expel the militant tendency from the Labour Party. But it was a long, hard haul. And Labour were not, as you know, re-elected between 1979 till 1997. So it was 18 years. And we've been out of power now for 12. And if the government run another two years, that will be 14 years. And who knows, if we don't win in two years' time, they'll have had another 18 years. So these things come and they disrupt the ability to be able to win a broad brush swathe of the electorate. Because we are a, a small C conservative country, much smaller C conservative than Scotland and Wales. And we, we have to take account of that if we'd rather be elected than just have a bloody good night out persuading each other there's gonna be a revolution. Well, um, after the 1997 victory for Labour, after you entered Parliament, you became Secretary of State for Education and Employment, and then you moved on to become Home Secretary after a great deal of success in that department. Um, you said in the documentary that you entered the Home Office with, quote, a radical agenda and the intention of driving change at breakneck speeds. But you also described clashing with Home Office officials who wouldn't even have a discussion and sort of just sat sullenly around tables as though praying for someone to come in and get rid of you. 
Do you want to just expand a bit on the difficulties you had there and perhaps how you got around there, them? There was a contrast with education. I was in education for four years. It was education and employment, which meant we did everything from the very early years, setting up the first ever nursery programme, national nursery programme. It's taken for granted now that three and four year olds will have access to a nursery education place in the state sector. It, it, it just didn't exist then. There were a handful of nursery schools. Um, we, we set up a, a literacy and numeracy programme for primary education to try and transform the life chances of children, many of whom had just been neglected and, and left behind. And a whole range of other things which we might come back to in questions which I'm incredibly proud of, including lifting the cap on access to higher education. There'd been a cap for eight years on the number of places in higher education. Uh, and there'd been a 40% drop in the spend per student. Can't even begin to imagine it now, but it had. So we had to move very quickly on, on that, which incidentally, I do take some responsibility for uh, tuition fees because we introduced a £1,000 tuition fee that, that was based on the parental income of the student rather than the repayment system for the student, which raised a billion pounds in the first two years, which allowed us to expand uh, education. Um, and, you know, I, again, I'm, no apologies, I'm very proud of that. I'm sick of people who say that education should be for higher education for the, the elite and 50% of 18 plus going to universities is diluting quality and that we should restrict. And by the way, they should be put, you know, why don't they take te technical qualifications? I'm fully in favor. I grew up on a council estate in the north of Sheffield where the people around me succeeded because of apprenticeships. So I'm totally in favor. But I'm sick of people who went to a university themselves and expect their children to go into university telling other people that they shouldn't. I think it's the height of hypocrisy. So when you find people doing that, just, just ask them whether you know, their own children are going to university and uh, see what the, the answer is. Right, the Home Office. The Home Office was a basket case. I mean, in many ways it still is, but I put that down to who's actually the Home Secretary at the moment as much as <laughs> what's actually in the department. And we might come back to that because the Nationality and Borders Act, which we fought against tooth and nail in the House of Lords, is frankly an abomination. And uh, I'm just surprised it hasn't got a lot more uh, coverage and a lot more campaigning against it. But we'll see what happens if people are transferred uh, to Rwanda. Um, the Home Office problem, and it goes back a very long way, was they didn't actually think they were responsible for anything. So it was best to just hover above the pro policy, uh, the policy areas and, and the problems and pretend that you couldn't do anything about crime and you couldn't do anything about drugs and you couldn't do anything about unwarranted uh, entry into the country. Uh, and they were okay when there was a crisis. So, you know, in the September, I became Home Secretary in the June because the election was delayed in 2001 because of foot and mouth disease. Um, and people couldn't move about, which again is just a reminder of the last two years. Uh, and so we had the election in June, and in September, Al Qaeda attacked the uh, Americans and blew up the, the Twin Towers uh, and brought down a plane in Pennsylvania. And we had to deal with that immediately. And the Home Office responded to that because it was a crisis. Whereas on day-to-day -day things that were making people's lives a total misery, they were utterly useless. Um, and we tried to get them to listen and take notice of what was going on outside and to get people in from private enterprise and other public services. We've been able to do that in education because the permanent secretary was very open to it. Just have a quick slurp. Michael Bishard, who's also in the Lords now, was the permanent secretary. And we brought in people who had hands-on experience in schools and colleges and in local authorities. So we brought in head teachers and teachers, people with specialisms in, in teaching. And they hadn't done that before. Um, it was just career civil servants. And we managed to do it without the civil service feeling threatened so that people were able to work together. 
<coughs> none of that had happened in the Home Office. And in the near four years that I was in the Home Office, we made some progress. We got some understanding of how to process uh, immigration and asylum claims. We got some understanding of diplomacy and doing deals with the French to close the massive encampment that was on uh, the, uh, the, the French soil near Calais uh, called saint uh, And we managed to put in measures where we got security and intelligence and immigration officers on French soil for the first time. And the relevance of that was, of course, that you, you process people uh, when they arrived at the coast rather than them coming to the UK and then claiming asylum. So we were able to to take substantial measures that stop the flow of people who could come through legitimate uh, economic routes or could come through the United Nations gateway, which we established with them, which was where uh, regions of conflict, uh, obviously people were displaced and people seeking asylum. And the United Nations High Commission for Refugees would set up a system with us, as they did with Liberia, <coughs> where genocide was taking place, uh, so that people could be nominated by them to come on a fast-track system to the UK and we would seek to integrate them in the community by working with the local communities in advance of them arriving. If only, if only I'd had the time, space and the money uh, to actually expand that system, I think we'd have been in a better place today. Well, you've just touched on that, but immigration obviously was an issue that caused constant problems in the Home Office and still does to this day. While you were in office there in 2003, Tony Blair made some quite heavy pledges on TV to cut the number of asylum claimants coming to Britain in half in a matter of months without having consulted you. What was your response when you heard that? Well, he said it on a programme on um, Sunday morning television. It was compared in those days by a guy called David Frost. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was uh, alert to the fact that he was going on and David Frost was going on and on and about, about over 100,000 asylum claims in the previous year and what we were going to do about it. And then I heard Tony saying, well, uh, in the next six months, we're going to take immediate action and in the next year, we're going to reduce it by at least 50%. And I phoned, it was in the early days, by the way, of mobile phones. I mean, this is ancient history to all of you. I phoned this car phone and he picked it up and I said, Tony, he said, David, I'm really, really sorry. I said, there's no point in being sorry. I, I said, what we've got to do now is to make it an aspiration, Tony. So get your press office to say that we've got an aspiration. The Home Secretary's up for taking the necessary steps and we'll see what we can do. It did take slightly longer than a year, but we got it down from 110,000 to 30,000 by the time I'd left and we did so by the alternative routes that I've described and by speeding up the process for those who had claimed asylum and for having perfectly legitimate uh, voucher uh, visas for people coming for employment. And we managed to get the growth in the economy and fill the vacancies that we needed through those legitimate economic visa routes, business uh, visa routes. And I, I, th one of the reasons we're so desperately short of labour today is not, as you will be told, uh, all the time now on radio, television and through the mainstream media, that people retired in large numbers during COVID. They did. And some people who got other jobs and decided they'd, they'd have an easier life and become part-time. Actually, the real reason we've got massive shortages at the moment real shortages of skills is because of Brexit, because a million people went back to Europe and nobody's allowed anymore to talk about Brexit, but I am. <laughs> right um, another group of civil servants that you interact with a lot over your tenure at the Home Office was the security service. And some of your predecessors, Roy Jenkins and Merlin Rees, for example, have expressed a view that MI5 sort of had an intrinsic distrust of the government and perhaps kept things from you. Did you form that impression yourself? Well, I had an intrinsic disgust, <laughs> distrust of MI5 because I was brought up in an era where MI5, the internal security service, MI6 is our external uh, security and intelligence service, uh, 
who got the details in Iraq so badly wrong. The MI5 is our internal security service and also was obviously dealing with the, Northern, the threat from Northern Ireland. Um, when I was brought up, they were suspected of being mainly focused on trade unionists and left-wing activists, including those who were in the anti-nuclear uh, weapon movement the, uh, and beyond. So there was, good, there was good evidence for that. If you read Peter Haynes' book about his time when he came from South Africa and the uh, campaign to support the ANC and against apartheid, there's no doubt whatsoever that that was the case. When I was there, I was deeply impressed with the professionalism and the balance uh, and the willingness to have some of their propositions overturned. But we were in a, a which I've just described, we were in a crisis moment where we needed to take action to ensure that we didn't have a similar attack in the UK to the one in the United States. And on the, on the night of the 11th of September 2001, we, we met in the cabinet office, it's called COBRA, but that's just the initials of the, of the cabinet office briefing room A, uh, which is a dungeon, but it has special facilities to stop people bugging it and facilities for uh, the, the cleared staff to be able to tune into what we were saying. We, we thought that night there was gonna be another attack and in the months after, we had to prepare to take measures to protect ourselves at the same time as protecting civil liberties. And that was probably the biggest challenge of my life, other than not being able to see, um, because getting that reasonably right, you never get it perfectly right, was an important lesson to me, because I had to listen and change my mind. The original legislation that we drew up within a month of the attack um, was improved enormously by genuine debate inside and outside Parliament. Democracy at that time, I think, worked well uh, for, the, for the British nation, including, and this really irritated me when I was Home Secretary, the House of Lords. Uh, I never expected to be in the House of Lords. Uh, I never said I wouldn't go into it. Quite a number of my colleagues said they would never go in the House of Lords. I keep meeting them in there. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I, I'd been reasonably careful about that. But the, uh, serve, in those days, the law lords were serving judges. Now it's the Supreme Court, uh, and therefore you don't have the law lords in the same way. But ex-judges, some very uh, highly respected barristers, a lot of people who had knowledge on these issues, as well as those campaigning for human rights, outside Parliament actually did bring to bear sensible arguments. And we did change the bill. And with one exception, which was to do with uh, overseas citizens who we couldn't return to their country of origin because of our commitment to uh, not sending people back to being um, to, to those countries that exercise capital punishment unless they gave absolute guarantees those people we needed to certificate because they were a threat. In the end, it was only 17, but the actual legislation was overturned three years later uh, by, the, uh, by the, the law lords, now the Supreme Court. But with the rest, with the exception of that, the rest of the bill has stood the test of time. That's brilliant. Um, let's finish just before I open it up to the floor with sort of a question about the modern Labour Party. Do you think it's ready to win the next election under Keir Starmer? I think it's getting there. I mean, I'm, I know that people Twitter, and I know this is being recorded because I've agreed, so uh, <laughs> I am going to be reasonably careful. Uh, well, after the local elections, I was on Radio Force Today programme on the Saturday morning, and I said I was over the moon that we'd actually won boroughs like Westminster, Wandsworth. Westminster we'd never won. Wandsworth we hadn't won since the 1970s and we'd won Barnet back, which has a very large Jewish community. And you couldn't help but be really pleased. But the performance overall was okay. It was recovering from the disaster of 2019, which was an absolute disaster. But of course, here's the real crunch. Whilst the Conservatives have major divisions, they're inside the Conservative Party, so the broad, swathe of right-wing opinion in this country 
has one party to vote for. If you are a progressive of the centre and left, you have Labour, the Lib Dems, the Greens, in Scotland, the SNP, to some extent, Clyde Cymru in Wales. The, le the centre and left is split all over the place. So, so long as the Conservatives can nudge above 35% and the other parties split the vote in an unhelpful way, the Conservatives could still win. So I've reluctantly, because I'm vehemently against proportional representation of multi-member constituencies, because I think that the single-member constituency attaches a member of parliament to the reality of having to represent a, a defined group of people with a defined uh, area, including business and the voluntary sector. So I, I'm in favour of the single-member constituency with all its flaws, but we've got to have some sort of informal understanding if we're not going to allow a, a, a minority of the country to win the next general election. Brilliant. Just so you're aware, Barley's kind of gone for a wander around the room saying hello to people. Is that all right? Uh, not really, because he shouldn't do that. Right. And I'll bring him he, back. He hasn't done that for a very long time. I Maybe. think he must be bored stiff. Come on. Um, Come and on. if you start wandering about, I'll know I've really cracked it. Come on. Come on. Come on, get down. <laughs> He's called Barley and he's very good natured and extremely good guide dog actually and he very rarely wanders off so, you know, let's liven it up so that Barley doesn't get too bored. <laughs> That's all right. Right, so we'll open up to the floor um, and we'll start with this one just here. Just there's a microphone coming. I, I do theology and um, religious philosophy. I just want to take you back to faith-based I, I can't hear too well. That's, that's age, not your voice. Can, can, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, I can. Thank you. I, I said I do theology and religious philosophy, and I yes. want to take you back to faith-based schools because that was a controversial policy for the Labour Party, and I think about 54 Labour MPs voted against the government on that. Um, do you think they were right to do so at the time? And I want to know whether or not Tony Blair's own faith came to the foreground um, in his um, conviction that the government should ext extend faith-based schools. Intellectually, I thought they had a very good point. In terms of practical politics and the real world, it was a non-starter. So although Tony's faith did on occasion shine through, it didn't affect decisions on embracing and retaining uh, faith-based schools and the reason for that is that you only take on battles that you know you can win or where you know that the battle you're taking on is going to be so counterproductive to everything else you're trying to do that you'll lose many of the other measures including probably the next general election because although a minority of students at school go to faith schools there's a terrific love for them in this country, and they do have something going for them. They have an ethos and a family commitment, not all of them, but a lot of them, a family commitment, that I once said I'd like to bottle, because if you could get that kind of community of interest and family commitment to education and to the aspiration of their children, and the faith commitment in the most deprived areas. I've seen schools, both Anglican and Catholic as the main schools, in deeply deprived areas, going the extra mile with the faith of those teaching in the schools being responsible for their willingness to go the extra mile outside the classroom. Then we'd, we'd be in a better place if we could bottle that and expand it. I don't think, as I just said a minute or two ago, the intellectual case is another matter, because if you were starting from scratch, you wouldn't invent a system where particular religions could oversee and have enormous influence on the education of children. You would want that to be uh, something that was undertaken and supported outside the classroom, including after-school activities where it was appropriate, but you wouldn't bed embed faith as part of your schooling system and you wouldn't then get to a position where inevitably we had to say that other faiths had the right so long as they adhered to a broad liberal cur curriculum overseen by the office of standards in education and all the rest of it 
We had, a we had a curriculum for all schools in those days. It's fragmented now. Academy schools don't have to follow it. Um, in those circumstances, it was impossible to argue against allowing other faiths to, to, uh, uh, to have uh, an input into schooling. I hope that, sorry, that's a very long answer, but I hope it answers your question. Thank you. Um, after you, uh, after Labour lost the 92 election, and sort of in the aftermath of that, do you, did you think that more limited, sort of perhaps more cosmetic reforms like that John Smith did were needed? Or did you always think that Labour needed to be more radical and more different um, and more centrist uh, as Tony Blair eventually did? I think they were sufficient to win, but not enough to win three terms, not enough to create the progressive movement and the upsurge of commitment to actually ensure that you didn't just win one election and then lose again, as was the pattern previously. I mean, 41 to, uh, 45 to 51, we got a full parliament plus a bit. 64 to 70, we got a bit followed by a full parliament. 74 to 79 was really difficult because we virtually didn't have a majority of any of that time and that was a, a little bit followed by a, a, a term. This was the first time we were aspiring to do it properly, to have time to bring in policies that would last, that would move, where you could move the agenda from one parliament to another to another. And whilst I thought that under John Smith we'd have won the subsequent election, and I liked John Smith and he was very generous to me because I backed the only other candidate against him, a guy called Brian Gould, who was New Labour before New Labour uh, and, and uh, got up John Smith's nose during the course of the battle for the leadership. And I was Brian's campaign manager, so I wasn't in a good place. And John gave me the Shadow Health job, which was generous of him because he could have given me a much min more minor portfolio. That was a really interesting two years. We were trying to modernise policy. But when Tony came in after John Smith's death, for those of you who are not familiar with this, John Smith died of a heart attack in May 2004. Um, I was Shadow Health Secretary, but I was also, for the year, because it was Buggin's turn, Chairman of the Labour Party. And I had to oversee the, uh, the election of a new leader in the middle of the European election campaign, which was taking place at the time, and with a number of candidates, all of whom aspired, but two in particular, Gordon Brown and Tony Blair. And that was quite tricky between May the 12th when John died and the uh, end of July when we had the, the final election. Tony, I'll just tell you a quick story. T Tony invited me round for something to eat at their house in Islington, and Sherry came in because she'd been working all day, obviously, late, apologising, and produced this appalling salad she'd bought on the way back from Sainsbury's. And we spent an evening with me trying to pretend I was quite enjoying it, uh, whilst Tony tested out whether his views about modernising and reforming education accorded my, with my own, because the party's education policy was pretty well run by the biggest of the teachers' unions. It was very much rooted in the past. And Tony wanted to know whether I'd got a, a radical take on this, because I, I was, you know, to the left of Tony, and still is, uh, to the, still, I still am to the left of Tony, uh, on, on many things. And we, we sort of had an accord. And from that moment, he decided he'd give me the job of Shadow Education, Shadow Education Employment Secretary, and the rest is history. But I did have two and a half years to be able to really get to grips with that and to have absolutely clear policies with the 97 election. 92 probably saved the Labour Party from another t disaster because you, you, those of you doing history or economics will know about um, the absolute collapse of the economy some months after the general election in 92 when Norman Lamont was the Chancellor of the Exchequer and inflation went to 15% and we had to withdraw from what was called the economic, uh, the ERM, the, um, the, the mechanism across 
Europe, um, which was effectively like a modern gold standard. And we, ha we had to withdraw from that. And there was a, a temporary economic crisis and Labour would have been blamed for it. I mean, we always pick up the pieces when we're elected. We get a crisis and then we get elected and then things move on. And we, all, we, all, we also get blamed when we've got Britain out of a crisis. We got blamed for the world global banking meltdown in 2008. And honestly, we didn't have a narrative. Gordon Brown actually brought the major international uh, institutions together, the G20, in the spring of 2009, stabilised what was a deeply unstable world economy by getting agreement uh, across those major institutions, got no credit for it whatsoever, uh, whilst opposition parties pretended that it had all been invented in Britain and we were responsible for having to borrow uh, to bail out the banks and save the banks. Mm. I, I went to America in 2009 and I was shopping and a guy behind the counter said, how are things in the UK then? He said, uh, we're a bit of a mess here. I said, well, we're in a bit of a pickle at home. He said, well, what's the matter? I said, well, we've, uh, we've had the same problem that you've had that you caused with your subprime mortgage fiasco. He said, what sort of crisis is that? So the banking crisis, we're in complete meltdown. He said, no idea that it was happening. I said, yeah, it's happening in the rest of Europe as well. I said, we're hit more by it because we have a larger banking sector. We rely much more on the services industries uh, than uh, other countries. And I only mention that just to demonstrate that honestly, we are so blooming insular in Britain. We don't see what's happening. And I heard uh, Rishi Sunak, uh, was it on Monday, saying, well, th you know, we're in a world crisis. There's nothing we can do about it. This is, the, the, this is global inflation and uh, global trauma uh, on the back of uh, uh, Ukraine and, uh, and everything else. Well, it is in part. I just wish they'd remembered that back in 2008-9. Thanks, Lord Blunkett, for speaking to us today. Uh, you've mentioned quite a lot about your time as Secretary of State for Education and Employment. Obviously, that's not what the uh, department is called now. And I'm wondering if, for you, um, is your view of education that it is intrinsically linked with employment and the goal of education should be to prepare young people for, the, uh, for, for future job opportunities and uh, the job market? Part of it is but differently to the traditional method of viewing this. You know, if you talk to people about preparing youngsters for the job market and for employment, they'll talk about basic skills, which are important. They'll talk about looking at the immediate job market and preparing people for it. In the past, where traditional industries obviously mopped up, attracted, large swathes of the local community, whether it was steel engineering, mining, which it was in the area I grew up in, or shipbuilding, uh, major heavy, heavy industry. People just moved from being put through school and almost encouraged and planned to go into those jobs. We live in an entirely different world now. The, Preparation for employment, in my view, is about preparing people for the enormity of flexible, responsive, lifelong learning, where people will change jobs, change careers, change within jobs all the time, not just because of the development and the speed of new technology, but of artificial intelligence and robotics, the nature of the way in which we do jobs will change beyond all recognition. Anything I can think of now will probably be out of date in 20 years' time. So my take on education is to open up people's minds to creativity, to imagination, to being able to work together in teams, to be able to uh, take on the challenge of really rapid change, which is a, a fear for many people Uncertainty, insecurity, rapid change is for many a, a real no-no and it creates fear which then creates a reaction. Not for most people in this room, I imagine there are some people in this room, but for most people in this room, 
globalization will be a positive rather than a negative. And your experiences of travel, of your connections with family or with relatives or with um, community will prepare you well for that and your schooling will have done. But for most pupils, that still, still isn't the case. So we have a work to do. And the other corollary to this is actually education's about the individual. It, it's about lighting a candle and blowing on it and inspiring youngsters to inquiring minds, to being able to develop their talent, whatever it might be, to be able to love learning and to want to carry on learning. We, we're miles off still doing that. And I made a small contribution in the four years I was there, introducing citizenship into the curriculum, trying to change the way we taught history, uh, being more imaginative about literature. But it was only a minor contribution to that endeavor. And in all our, in everything we do, we stand on the shoulders of those who come before us. So the, the task now is to persuade the Labour Party and progressive forces generally, that when we get the chance, we build on the past, we learn from the mistakes, but we actually build for the future. And that's what we've got to do. Thank you very much for going to speak to us. Um, you said just then, learn from the past. And it seems that maybe the current Labour Party haven't really done that when they look at how successful the government that you were involved in were. Um, and it seems almost that the current Conservative Party were almost sitting on that centrist ground, which maybe the, your government had once. Do you think there's anything that the Labour government can do that's closer to the kind of like Blair policies or even just um, rhetoric or strategy? It's partly the internal contradictions within the Labour Party itself. We, we've never really been able to develop a political education program since the 1930s and 40s that actually was edu educative about how politics works. So we're always arguing internally within the Labour Party as though progressives are neoliberals and are betraying the cause and the true believers are the ones who actually think that the electorate's got it wrong and they're right, whatever's happening. You know, um, the, the famous phrase years ago about, uh, I think Bertolt Brecht actually mirrored it in a play, if only we could change the electorate. Well, we can't. So we have to actually deal with what we've got. And those contradictions exist now in the Labour Party, coming out of the Corbyn era, as they did within the era of Jeremy between 2015 and 2019. And they've existed for a very long time and they will continue to be uh, a battleground. But unless the Labour Party membership are in tune with the need for reforming progressive, radical, but sane policies that people can sign up to, where you take them a step at a time, you get elected, and, I'll, and I'll, I, I will challenge my own experience. We weren't radical enough in our second term because we hadn't really clocked that we'd done enough in the first term to get another majority of 165. Had we really clocked that, I think we'd have done much better. To get a Labour Party that says, yes, we'll, we'll do enough in the first term to ensure that we can be re-elected and then we'll be more radical, and then we'll be more radical still. Instead, we've always, as I was describing earlier, we've said, okay, we're in, we might only be in for four years, let's slam them, let's, let's go for it, and then we get, we're out again at the end of it. Or we're not moving on sufficiently. The radical Labour government of 45 was very good. By 1950, people were tired. They'd been in the wartime cabinet as well but they were also not visionary about the future. So whilst the Tories promised to do away with rationing, it took them three years to do it, but they promised they would, Labour was still talking top-down plan, planned politics where rationing, people had had enough. There's a book by David Kiniston called um, Austerity Britain, 45 to 51. You might not want to read it all, but if you're interested in any of this, then just dip into it.
because he uses mass observation, which is much more profound than opinion polling. Mass observation was a system devised back in 1937 to test people's views. They kept diaries, honest diaries that he's been able to draw down on. People were shattered by 1950. They'd had enough of being told what to do and that there was going to be more misery. They'd had enough of a government that actually put income tax up uh, just before a general election to pay for our involvement in the uh, Korean War. Uh, and, you know, they wanted to be promised something better. And we hadn't got it at the time. We hadn't moved on from the 45 Manifesto. And the lesson I learned, and I learned in government, is you're constantly having to rejoice in what you've achieved and then build on it and become more progressive rather than less. And sometimes you have to refresh those around you in a brutal way. I, I was refreshed out because my private life hit the buffers when I had a, a, a long-term uh, um, relationship uh, with a married woman. I wasn't married at the time, but that's no excuse, and decided to fight like hell for my tiny son. And that saw me out of politics, or that side of politics. Tony, Tony Benn rightly said, when he left the House of Commons, I've returned to the true political arena. Uh, so I'm not out of politics, and I wasn't when I left the cabinet, but it was a trauma for me personally. By the way, I would do it again. I, I, would, uh, I, would, I would fight for my son again, I mean. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, he's doing fine, and I went out to see him in America uh, two weeks ago because he's now at a university in the States. So it was worth fighting for. Always do the right thing, even if at the time people think you're a crazy idiot doing the wrong thing. Um, just to, this is working, just to bring you back a bit to what you were talking about in one of the earlier questions from Sam about the Labour Party and about the way we constantly repeat the, the mistakes of our past. There's a very good speech by Harold Wilson. I think it's the 75 Congress, the 75 Conference, sorry. And he talks about the tyranny of the membership, how the membership always overrule the voters, how the policies we get are generally the policies the membership wants, not what the voters want, and how Labour always, as a result, panders to the people middle class enough or radical enough to buy Labour memberships rather than the voters and what the voters would like to see from the Labour Party. How do we get over that in the 2020s? Is it a case of restricting the rights of the membership within CLPs and within conference, or do we just have to accept that moderates in the Labour Party have to fight these same fights and learn the same lessons from these battles and win again, whether it's this decade or the next one? Well, Tony Benn was writing, so I knew Tony Benn quite well, and his son Hilary became one of my special advisors and then a minister uh, in the Home Office with me, uh, and he's a great guy. Uh, and actually, his brother has just become a member of the House of Lords because he decided he'd like to retake the title of Lord Stansgate. But anyway, there we go. So there are two of them in Parliament. Um, Tony Benn once said that nothing really good had ever been achieved without struggle. And I think he's right. And I'm afraid the trajectory ahead is that those of you of your age are going to have to go through the struggle all over again, both within and outside a political party for things that you believe in, for the rationality of what you want to do and the ability to be able to do it. It's not that you don't want to do some things, it's working out how to do them. It's statescraft, it's, it's how to understand how to do politics. It's not a kind of game where you just throw something up in the air and hope it comes down at the right place. You, you've got to work through where the, where the electorate are, how you can take them with you, how you can move them on, so that they, they believe that their values and your values are actually the same. You need to watch the elephant traps, which don't just come from the arguments of the membership within the party. They come from campaign and fringe groups that suddenly emerge. And they've got a, a, they're determined that the party, the party must adopt what it is that they want, and they must do it in a very particular way. And then that becomes, I mean, I'm talking at the moment about identity politics, as it's known. The culture wars is, is a gift 
to the Tory party. Absolute gift. And every time people walk into the trap, they make things more difficult in relating to those we need to reach out to. Not that we don't take them with us. I mean, Lord, the Labour Party managed to break down tremendous social conflict and values. I mean, who would have, nobody would have thought in that 1975 speech you've referred to that a Labour government would have been able to bring in civil partnerships. They just wouldn't. Uh, so, you know, the world can be moved on, but it has to be moved on by proper debate and argument within the party to move our membership with us, and then to be able to take the electorate. And it shouldn't be rocket science, but it is damn difficult. And if it weren't, Labour would have been in office from 1945 onwards. Mm. And just think, I just want to give you one statistic. Only a sixth of the voters aged more than 65 voted Labour in 2019. Just think about that for a minute. But they voted in vastly greater numbers in the election than the 18 to 30s. And whilst that continues to be the case, we've got a problem. Uh, hello. Uh, you briefly mentioned the New Deal with Rwanda. So uh, I'm from Australia and I guess a, a lot of the, these immigration policies have been uh, perhaps copied from there or, to, or inspired from, from there. Um, in Australia, this has become really a huge uh, issue for Labour. Any suggestion that they're different from the centre-right party on, this, uh, on the issue of uh, how to deal with asylum seekers is usually met with a huge scare campaign and Labour's very determined not to be very different from... Uh, from the other parties on this issue. Do you think that could potentially happen in the UK with Labour, that they would also face difficulties with this issue? I, so will you forgive me if we have a bit of a dialogue in front of the audience on this, because you will be able to correct me if I'm wrong. The National Party brought it in. The Labour Party said they would do away with it, but then found a massive reaction when they were going to do that, and then reversed their... Po Is that correct? I'm not entirely sure, to be honest. No, I'm, I'm asking the questioner. Uh, well, well, well... So there was a toing and froing by the Labour Party who were against and then for and then against again. Well, they, they wanted to bring in offshore processing. Yeah. Multiple deals fell through, one with Malaysia. Yeah. Um, eventually, they had leadership struggles in the party itself, yeah. but they established offshore processing with Nauru just before yeah. they lost office. Mm. But they were not keen on boat turnbacks, which was the, the big um, yeah. uh, difference that the Liberal Party wanted to yeah. enact, well, which the, Labour now supports. Yeah, the, the comparators are not easy because you go a thousand miles of sea and uh, in, in some instance it was, it, it was possible to turn around. The, the very small numbers, I mean, they cost now, because there's still, I think, 250, something like that, people who are in the camps, it's costing about a million pounds an individual. I mean, in this country, we, e even the, the most right-wing fanatic wouldn't countenance a million pounds per uh, migrant in terms of uh, putting them in a camp or sending them to Rwanda. The issue here is a simple one. If people come to Britain, across the channel, because I, to I talked earlier about the reasons why they're coming in boats, actually, because the coming under trains, in lorries, in trucks, in the back of cars, was effectively clamped down on from the agreement in December 20, uh, 2002. And gradually that's taken shape. So they're coming in small boats. They get across the channel in a small boat and they have a choice, a real choice. Do they claim asylum and under the new system find themselves sent to Rwanda or do they disappear into the ether and go into the sub-economy? Or when they get placed in this encampment in Yorkshire, and by the way, the Prime Minister's questions today, the Tory MP for the area pleaded with Boris Johnson not to do it because the local people are up in arms, the secure camp that they're gonna put people in. Um, would you abscond from there or would you wait to be sent to Rwanda? Uh, 
a country that in 1994 had the most horrendous genocide and a country where the United States investigation of their current human rights back in 2018 discovered that there were major, major problems. I think, you know, it's a no-brainer. People will hit our... Sh they'll still come. They'll just disappear into the sub-economy or they'll get caught and then when they're put in a place, they'll escape from it. I mean, that's what's going to happen. So the policy is not only immoral, it's unworkable. And, you know, sometimes you get an immoral policy that works and sometimes you get a very moral policy that doesn't work, but it's very rare you get any moral policy that's unworkable. <laughs> oh, well, I think we've probably run out of time, so thank you very much, everyone, to speak to us. It's been brilliant to have thank you. Thank you. Thank you.